All right. So um, we are. This is being recorded, right? Yes, it's it's being recorded. Yes. Okay. Very good. So um, maybe I, Arida, you can start, and uh, after that, you can give remarks from Al Nafi because this course will be hosted on the Al Nafi platform. Although we don't have the link for it yet, but we will provide it soon. So, okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Arita, okay, why don't you start? Okay. Uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, yeah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Rabbi sahri sadri wa yasiri amri wa hlul uqdata milisani ya fukahu kauli. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Uh, good night, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday talk. Uh, the Sunday talk is hosted by Gozali Project and supported by Al Nafi Management. Uh, and then I will let me introduce about our topic tonight. Uh, tonight, uh, the discussion uh, held the discussion held tonight also open a first statistic class, which be held for six months every two weeks. Uh, and then uh, I inform you to our topic. It's about our professor's journey toward the light. Uh, later we will hear uh, how our professor experience with uh, with his education uh, while studying at the best college in America. He got the knowledge didn't guide him in making the best use of the precious gift of life. Uh, in short, from his deeper research uh, revealed that the West has redefined the meaning of knowledge, uh, and it is doesn't match, uh, doesn't making uh, it is not uh, match with the Islamic conception of, uh, of knowledge. Uh, for all this experience, his experience, we will hear detail uh, later, mm, and then. Uh, uh, let me. Uh, let me to introduce our uh, professor. Uh, he is uh, the director of Ulumul Umron and Al Nafi Online Education Platform, uh, and he graduated bachelor from uh, M MIT and must, uh, master and PhD from Stanford University. Uh, and I inform to those who first time join this lecture, you actually can access the previous lecture with sharing in our team. Uh, and, and for this first class uh, meeting uh, about statistic, uh, you can, after, after the lecture, you can ask the question uh, in, in, box, uh, in the chat box in this Zoom room. Uh, uh, or also can raise hand to uh, give a, a question uh, to our professor tonight. Uh, now I'm going to hand over the time to our professor. All right. This time is yours, um, Prof. All right. Bismillah rahman rahim So this is our first lecture on... Uh, statistics, but it has been at least 10 years, maybe closer to 20 that I have been working on this course, slowly piece by piece, as I was taught um, statistics at Stanford by the best statistician in the world, and we had followed the latest curriculum. But um, after a while, we, we I became very uh, dissatisfied because some of the central questions that we have in statistics, like what is probability? What are the parameters? What do they mean? How do we learn about the parameters from the data? All of these questions, which are very basic, there was no, uh, no agreement on the answers. So I started to think why this is, first I started to find the right answer, but then I said, I started to think about uh, why there is disagreement. And so basically, slowly I got very uh, discontented with the standard answers to this question. And uh, 
had to probe deeper. I'm now going to um, go through the slides, which will explain my personal experiences. So I hope that my slide share is now working. Yes, everybody can see the slides now? Yes, bro. Okay. So I'm going to start the slideshow. All right, so uh, just to start at the beginning, from um, childhood, I was given very specialized training by my father, who was very much into education. And basically, one of the key things was that he loved me very much. And he had faith in me that I could do whatever I wanted. And this was very important. This is something very important for us teachers to know that we have to have faith in our students. We have to believe that they can do anything. And if we believe in them, they will perform wonderfully. Um, another thing that he taught me, my father, is that don't go with the group. If everybody believes something, it is not binding on you. And you should follow your own ideas and search for the truth. And he also thought that this formal education, the degrees that we go, this is just chasing after paper. It is not meaningful. And so we should just get, uh, because real education is from life experience. All of these things turned out to be true, that the things that I learned in, in college in this courses, they were not very useful in life. Uh, what was really important was the life experience in terms of educating me. So, uh, because my father said, thought that uh, the formal education, the degrees we get are just, just paper and no real education takes place. So he, he wanted us to get uh, quickly through the education uh, so that we could start living. And so that's why he prepared us to get through the education quickly. And so I got my education, uh, I got my uh, admission to MIT when I was only 16. I finished the MIT bachelor's in three years and, and I was 19. And then I finished the PhD program <clears throat> in another three years. So I was 22 when I uh, left Stanford with a PhD in economics and statistics. Much later, I realized that the education I had received was uh, meaningless. At that time, I did not think so. Uh, but, but much later, I realized the wisdom of my father that this, all this education that I received was really meaningless. And why? Because real education is about how I should live. This is the key question. I have this uh, brief life how should I spend it? So this question does not have any answer. You can study as much physics and chemistry and biology, but it will not teach you how to become a good person, how to do tazki of your soul, how to uh, do, how to be kind, compassionate, how to have courage, how to love other people. So these questions are not part of science, not part of education, and these are the most important questions. So, um, because my education was, did not train me about the meaning of life. And uh, also in my youth, our father was also a very modern person in his, uh, when, he, when I was young. Later on, he became much more religious, but that was much later and I didn't receive the training at that time. So, I was searching for meaning and ultimately my father joined Tabligh and he invited me to join that. And so this movement of Tabligh and Dawa was uh, very important in uh, shaping my ideas. And I learned that the learning of the head is very different from the learning of the heart. And that real 
important uh, education is the uh, takes place in the heart. So once I went through this program of Tripoli, I spent four months. Then uh, it le led me to some very great confusion because uh, I, we, from history we studied that Islam, Islamic teachings took mankind from, you know, from Bedouin, from uh, Jahiliya to the most advanced civilization on this planet. And, it, and uh, the Quran says that it provides complete and perfect guidance and that this gift that we have received the knowledge from Allah is better than anything that anybody else can gather. But, so this is what the Quran teaches, but I had also been trained at MIT and Stanford. And what they taught me at MIT and Stanford is that the only valuable knowledge today is that uh, has been created by the West. Every course that I took, uh, mathematics, chemistry, physics, biology, history, all the books were written by Western authors. And there was no mention of the Quran. So, uh, everything, all important knowledge is creation of the West over the past three centuries. It has no relation to the Quran on the one hand. And on the other hand, the Quran is telling me that this is the most, most important knowledge that has ever been given to mankind. And it is complete and perfect. And it is sufficient for our guidance until Yawm al Qayyamah. So, these two are messages which are in direct conflict with each other. I could not understand how to make sense of this. So, the basic uh, thing which uh, I understood after a long time, after prayers uh, to Allah to guide me from this uh, difficulty, I realized that there are two types of knowledge. One is the knowledge of the head and the other is the knowledge of the heart. And the Western methodology teaches us that don't pay any attention to the heart, only pay attention to the head. <clears throat> See, for example, this is the uh, Descartes, who's called the father of Western philosophy. He says, I think, therefore I am. So when you're thinking about your existence, then you focus on your thoughts, not on your heart. You could also say, I feel, therefore I am. And in fact, that is the more natural thing. If somebody thinks about his own existence, then the first thing he will become aware of is his feelings, his, his heart is beating, his, my, my skin is uh, feeling sensation. So my experience is the most direct and immediate proof of my existence, not that I'm thinking thoughts. So when I search for guidance from Allah, that how can this be that the Western knowledge is the most important kind of knowledge and also the Quran is the most important type of knowledge. This cannot be, both cannot be true. Then I was um, read this book called Orientalism, which, which came out in the 70s. <coughs> and uh, this is very important uh, book in um, shaping my thoughts because it said that a whole field of knowledge, European description of the East is Eurocentric. It is actually not true. It is just an expression of the superiority of the West. Uh, and basically what he says, the main argument is very simple, that in the, by the early 20th century, Europe controlled 90% of the globe. And um, so they got a superiority complex. They started to think that we are better than everybody else. And in the East, we acquired an inferiority complex. We started to think that we are inferior. Uh, but the goal of life, because the Europeans rejected Christianity as a public religion, so then they made the goal of life pursuit of pleasure, power, and profits. And the knowledge that they created was helpful to achieve these goals. But these are not Islamic goals. So at that point, I decided that um uh, after uh, and you know what the the book that edward said wrote orientalism it discredited an entire field of knowledge and at that time there were schools of oriental studies departments of oriental studies at most colleges 
and universities in the USA and UK and Europe. But after Edward Said showed that this was all just prejudice, there was nothing uh, real in this. So then these departments were dismantled and they, they disappeared and people who used to call themselves Orientalists, they were specializing in the study of the Orient, they also disappeared. This whole field of study disappeared. So this was very encouraging to me because I was thinking that lots of ideas of economists are very crazy. And I came to the realization that maybe all of economic theory is also another form of Orientalism. It is just a way of saying that the West is superior to the East and it doesn't have any real content or substance. So um, this idea became my goal. I wanted to show that economics, all of economics is just a fraud. But this was a big task, economics, all of economics is a very big field. How can I show that it is all wrong? So I decided to um, uh, take small steps towards a big goal. There is a pedagogical principle, very important for us as teachers and students to understand that a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So if you want to master a field, you won't do it all at once. You just take one small step at a time. And um, also, if something seems difficult, there is nothing that is difficult to learn. The only thing that happens is that you're trying to take too big a step. You're trying to learn too many things at once, too fast. And that's why it is difficult. If you just take one small step at a time, you can make progress. And with just keeping taking one small step, you, will, you can master any subject. There is no subject which is difficult. So as teachers, we must increase the confidence. The students are, are, are frustrated because they think they cannot understand, because they think they are stupid. It is not true. All, the, all students have the capability to learn anything, provided that the subject matter is broken up into small steps, which they can understand one step at a time. And uh, there's a special spiritual exercise which you need to do, which is to give thanks to Allah for the small increase in our understanding because in shagartum la azidandakum. So if we make thanks to Allah for the little bit of understanding that we have, Allah Ta'ala will increase that understanding and reward us with more ill. So <clears throat> I started my journey with small steps towards the rejection of economics the first crucial book in this direction was uh, by Paul Byrock called Economics and World History, Myths and Paradoxes. And uh, in this, he showed that historically, the theory of free trade was created by England after it had 50 year lead on other European countries via industrial revolution. So who's uh, developing this theory? The people who have the most to benefit from it. And then when this free trade theory was applied to Germany and uh, France and other European countries, it led to depression because the English had a great advantage over those. They, they were ahead in their sales revolution. They exported their projects, uh, their products and the countries like Germany and France, they could not compete. So German economist Friedrich List developed the theory of in infant industry. And he said that we have to protect our economy. We can't allow free trade because we will never develop if we, if we do so. And so <clears throat> uh, his theory was followed and they protected their industries and then they were able to compete and become equal to USA. So the lesson is not about free trade. The lesson here is about when you see an economic theory, you have to look at the historical context, who developed this theory, why did they develop it, whose interests were being served. This is very important. Same is true of statistics. Who invented this theory? Why did they invent it? And uh, what uh, was the advantage? Who gained the advantage from it? <clears throat> so coming to economic theory, uh, if you look at the history of it, you find that in the late 19th century, there was something called battle of methodologies. And um, 
original approach to economics, which is historical and qualitative, was replaced by the quantitative and scientific approach. This was a big mistake because the idea that you can apply science to economics means that there are some universal laws of economics which apply to all societies across time and place. And this is just absurd. It is a foolish idea. The laws of economics for Pakistan are not the same as laws of economics for Turkey. And they're not the same as laws of economics for England and not the same as the laws of economics for Nigeria. Each country has its own history and its own circumstance. But economic theory pretends falsely that there are some mathematical laws which you can apply to study Nigeria and Pakistan and France and England. And these laws are the same in the 19th century and in the 20th century and in the 21st century. This is just a wrong idea. But this is the basis of modern economics. So actually, this idea is so crazy that uh, I was led to think about how can intelligent people believe such crazy ideas, which are some completely in conflict with what we see in the world around us. So for example, I mean, at Stanford University, we studied models of economics, which, are, which were completely crazy, which made no sense at all. For example, the trade theory model we study assumes that both countries have exactly the same technology. This is not true. Uh, the, uh, the finance theory models study, uh, assume that the stock markets behave rationally, even though the global financial crisis proves otherwise. So the question is, how can intelligent people believe such crazy theories? So to study this, we have to go into the history of how the Western people, how European people started thinking these thoughts. And this history I have described in other articles, but basically the enlightenment of Europe, the renaissance of the rebirth took place after the uh, European barbarians conquered uh, Islamic advanced civilization, which was degenerate. And then they became, then they translated millions of books. So it was basically the light of Islam, which spread through Europe and uh, ended their dark ages. And, but this new knowledge was in conflict with what they knew before the Catholic church. And this created a battle between science and religion led to the breakup of the church and more than a century of bloody warfare between Christian factions, which led the Europeans to reject religion. And uh, they lost faith in Christianity. And so they needed to create another body of knowledge to replace Christianity. So uh, one of the problems that arose was that uh, what you can call the trauma of loss of faith. Everybody had believed in Europe that Christianity is the one true religion. And now it turned out so people thought that this is all wrong. So something that everybody believes for sure can prove to be wrong. So they built a new theory of knowledge in which they said, we will only trust what we can touch and what we can see. And so this new theory of knowledge, this epistemology uh, is built on the idea that there is no one watching, no one cares. There is no justice in this universe. Nothing matters. This universe was created by an accident and will end in an accident. So this is what logical positivism, the philosophy that emerged in the uh, 20th century is based on. It says that knowledge must be built on what we can touch and see and reason, observations and logic. It doesn't take into account human experience and especially it rejects our intuition and our heart as a source of knowledge. The Quran says that have they not hearts by which to reason and ears by which to hear. So our hearts also can think and Allah Ta'ala says that it is not the eyes that are blind, but the hearts that are blind. And this is exactly what the West, Western intellectual tradition does. It, it uh, blinds the heart. And that is what makes this knowledge very deadly. 
and dangerous because there is no heart in it. It is heartless knowledge. And statistics is also built on the same positivist foundations. So one of the key assertions of positivism is that it rejects unobservables. It says that uh, the Quran begins with Alif Lam Mim Zalikil Kitabul Lare Bafi Badalil Muttaqeen Allazina Yuk Minuna Bil Ghaib. So the first description of the people of Taqwa is those who believe in the unseen. As opposed to this, logical positivism is the direct opposite. It's, a, it's, a, it's like Allazina Yunkiruna Bil Ghaib. They reject belief in the unseen. And they say that any, anybody who believes in anything unseen, this is irrational. So they reject intuition, they reject feelings. And this positivist attitude towards knowledge has had and continues to have catastrophic consequences. And so I'm not going to, uh, I have discussed these conferences in other papers. Here I'm just going to look at how this works in statistics, how the rejection of unobservables makes it impossible to do statistics correctly. So first, uh, a more general problem is that the Western philosophers have been arguing about what is this thing called science for centuries without coming to an answer. There is this famous textbook by Chalmers called What is this thing called science? And he discusses in 12 different chapters, a dozen different theories about what science is. And he comes to the conclusion, nobody knows what science is. And there's a reason for this. The scientific method was invented by Ibn al Haysam around 1000 AD. And basically, science is about using the observations, the ayatullah, to discover the hidden reality. So, for example, we look at the properties of vision and we deduce that there are light rays which travel in straight lines. <coughs> These are not visible. So, we, we see through the appearances to the hidden reality. So, for example, you see the falling apple and you deduce, deduce the existence of gravity and you see this beautiful universe and you discover, uh, you, you deduce the existence of creator. Now, this type of logic is not accepted by Western intellectuals because it is not certain. You, you make a guess about what uh, the reality is, but because it's hidden, you can never be sure. So, because the European intellectuals had the trauma of loss of faith, they were burnt by their false belief in Christianity. So, they decided not to trust intuition, not to trust the heart. And they said, we will only believe something if it is certain, if it is sure. And so, basically, the philosophy of science was developed to prove that science is certain. But uh, this, this led to a contradiction because actually nothing is certain in this life. All inference that we do is uncertain. The future is radically uncertain. We, nobody can tell what will happen. So we can only do guesswork. But the philosopher said that we must use knowledge which is sure, which is certain. And uh, this uh, dramatically wrong picture of science led to a dramatically wrong epistemology, ontology, and methodology in all of the areas of knowledge that have been developed by uh, European intellectuals over the past few centuries. So what are the consequences of rejecting unobservables? Inkar bil ghaib or yunkiruna bil ghaib? Well, uh, Skinner basically, who invented behavioral psychology, he wrote this book called Beyond Freedom and Dignity. And basically the book says that humans are robots and we can be programmed by stimulus and response conditioning. This, this is a dramatically wrong theory of human behavior. And basically, because of its failures, it was rejected and replaced, but only small improvements have been made. Uh, in economic theory, we have a dramatically wrong theory of human welfare. What makes human beings happy? Well, it is loving and being loved. It is kindness and compassion. But economists think that human happiness lies in consumption, eating more and more. And that's just ridiculous nonsense, but this is the basis, the foundation of economic theory, that the goal of life for human beings is to eat more. 
this is such a ridiculous and absurd theory that it can only be proposed by someone whose hearts have become blind. So the fundamental problem facing the European intellectuals, and this is actually something explicitly has been said by Max Weber, that they took a stance of epistemic arrogance. They said that we can start with zero knowledge and then we can build up to all uh, knowledge that is necessary on the basis of observations and logic. This is in contradiction with the Quran, which says that we have only been given a little bit of knowledge. Imam al-Ghazali set out to do this method that start from zero and try to build to certain knowledge. And he came to the conclusion that you cannot do this. If you doubt everything, you can never arrive at certainty. So the only way out of this difficulty is if Allah Ta'ala puts the nur of his guidance in your heart. So there are three types of logic. There is deductive reasoning, which is the central type used in the West. And it says that if you have A, then you can argue, you can arrive at deduction B. But from deductive reasoning, you can never produce new knowledge because when A implies B, then the information in B is already contained in A. Now there are two types of reasoning which can produce new knowledge, inductive reasoning, abductive reasoning. But uh, in such cases, it is always a guess. <laughs> Induction leads, is a guess and abduction leads to a guess. And this is not certain. Uh, and so, and, and from induction and from abduction, you can arrive at the idea that there is a God who created the universe. And the Europeans were very strongly interested in preventing this conclusion. They did not want to be able to deduce the existence of God because they had seen that Christianity called, caused so much damage. So they did not accept these types of reasoning in building up their epistemology. And so this idea that only science leads to valid knowledge led to the attempt to apply science to all domains of human knowledge. But this is also another absurd idea because human beings don't obey mathematical laws and we are not like particles that you can predict our behavior. And this attempt to apply positivist philosophy to constructions of theories about human beings and societies has been a disastrous failure. This social science that the West has created has been a tremendous failure. Instead of arguing about uh, specific theories, you can just look at the Western society and how it is suffering from the breakdown of the family. More than 50% of the children being born in Europe and USA are born to single mothers. They never see the safety and security and the love and comfort of a stable family life. They never see it. So this is a complete failure, a disaster. So <clears throat> uh, there are two questions here. The social science is deeply flawed. It is so easy to see the problems in social science that uh, any child can see it. Once you explain that social science is really study of human society and there cannot be universal laws about it, it is uh, different societies are different and they follow different laws, this is obvious and it can be easily proven. So then a uh, second question arises. Why can't Europeans understand that this is absurd? Why, don't, why do they keep following methods which are completely crazy? Uh, and uh, there are some, uh, basically, uh, it has to do with the Orientalism, which led to a European attitude of superiority. They said that, yes, our lessons, our social science applies only to Europe, but the Europe is the most advanced society and all societies will become like Europe. So we can apply it to all societies. So this is very stupid, but this is the uh, theory which is currently being followed. So one of the key understandings that we have to realize is that the social science is the theme of the West. It is what the West uses to organize lives. And this deen is very different from the deen of Islam, the way of life of Islam. And they are in dramatic contradiction. And so basically all of modern science, social science is built on the framework of scientific theory, which is 
evolution and it says that basically human life is about competition for survival of the fittest and there are no rules which need to follow anybody can do anything as long as it helps his survival so this is the damaging and toxic and poisonous foundation upon which all of western social science is built but one very important thing to understand is that criticism does not lead to change uh, we uh, we need to develop an alternative to social science and this is currently in process and uh, rajiv shanturk has provided a lot of lectures on how to decolonize social science today we are following uh, the uh, social science which is the product of our colonization of minds and we have to get rid of this and build a new way of life for ourselves and this can only be done step by step in small steps so one small step in this process is to show that the entire discipline of statistics built over the past 100 years is completely defective and faulty and we need to just throw this out and rebuild the entire discipline on islamic epistemological foundations that is that with based on a new theory of knowledge and when we do this we come up with an entirely new way of thinking about statistics and doing statistics so before we start on statistics uh everybody every, all serious muslim thinkers are aware are agreed that today the muslim umma is in difficulty we are falling behind in many fronts on not just on the wealth front but also on the conduct the morality everything so why are we behind for this there are many people have many ideas and they are working on solutions but my diagnosis is that the central problem is the shock and awe of western knowledge because the western knowledge is in conflict with our deen and it is being taught all over the islamic world in western universities so we are all conflicted on the other hand our western education teaches us that west is superior and western knowledge is the most important kind and the quran teaches us that the quran is the most important and these two messages are in conflict and we cannot uh, understand the quran using western theories and western knowledge so that's why we need to uh, counter western knowledge by showing that it is wrong <laughs> so coming back to my personal journey when i uh, when i did my bachelor's in math at mit i learned a lot of respect for mathematical proof and rigorous proofs and i thought that you know intuition is useless <laughs> if you have intuition about something but you cannot prove it that's very bad it's it's, it's just a, like a form of ignorance but later i understood that intuition is more important and learning how to prove things is is not important um i specialized in uh, in my phd in econometric theory and for this i did a phd uh, training in graduate i took graduate courses in mathematics and in statistics and in economics because econometric theory requires all three and i went to my graduate advisor to ask about how to do uh, any about my specialization so he said you see there are two types of econometricians and one are the theoretical type they never touch data and they just do theory and then there are applied people who get their hands dirty with data and the prestige lies with the theoreticians <coughs> because of this i specialized in theoretical econometrics and uh, the simple fact is that i did not actually run a regression on real data until 10 years after graduate school because i was a theoretician i didn't actually do any real data analysis i wrote a textbook which was full of very advanced mathematics called statistical foundations for econometrics techniques it did not have any real world applications at all but while the book was in already in draft one of the reviewers said that this book is wonderful for theory but useless for practice i was stung by this remark and i said okay what is this nonsense i will just add some practical examples 
So for, I decided that in each chapter, I will put in one uh, example of real data analysis that comes from this chapter. I was totally surprised to find that I could not find even one realistic example. <clears throat> when I look at, when I tried to find real world examples, I found that all of the assumptions that we make in theory are not satisfied by any real data set. So with, it took me about five years to find some real world examples, which I could fit into my text. But I realized that the real world application of statistics is very different from the theory. And the theory of statistics we learn is not relevant to the solution of real world problems. Uh, I also met around this time, David Friedman, and he had exactly the same experience as I did. He also started out with a heavy duty mathematician and he has some very, very fancy, very difficult to understand mathematical papers in his early career. And later on, he started doing some legal work. He you got involved in some real world cases. Uh, one was about the census undercount that the way that uh, the population census is conducted, it undercounts minorities, which reduces their vote. And some other cases about discrimination against women and how much money, how much less money they make. Then he told me that when he started doing this, he said that, oh, so we are making these assumptions to do these calculations, but these assumptions are not valid. So he really got concerned about how the theory doesn't actually work, but people use it anyway. So he said, no, I'm not going to use it anyway. I'm going to try to do things correctly. And then he eventually he wrote this book called Introductory St Textbook of Introductory Statistics. Uh, and in this, there is not a single mathematical formula because he said mathematics is a distraction. It keeps, it prevents people from thinking. <clears throat> so I went to the, uh, after a long period of time uh, in the USA, I went to Pakistan. Uh, first, I went to Turkey to teach at Bill Kent University for six years. And then I went to Pakistan, taught at LUMS, and then I ended up at International Islamic University and uh, Higher Education Commission created a program to support PhD students. So I created a PhD program in econometrics. I wanted to teach econometrics, but um, because that, is, that was a specialized skill that I had, which nobody else had at that time. And so in, in Pakistan. So I thought about how I could do this because it would be impossible for me to teach all the mathematics and the statistics and the probability and the economics that was required for uh, that the training I had, I could not give. But after thinking about the utility aspect, how to make this useful, uh, instead of doing theory, if I wanted to focus on practice, then I realized I could do it. It's, uh, it's a very important metaphor that I understood. See, you have a car. Suppose I say, how do you manufacture a car? Now, this is very, very difficult. There is, you know, you have to do metallurgy, you have to do engines, you have to do pistons and cylinders and radiators and huge amount of learning required to manufacture a car. But how about how to drive a car? But that's very easy. Everybody can do it. And uh, people all over the world with very little knowledge, not even having high school diploma, not even knowing how to read and write, they can learn how to drive. So I said, I'm going to teach econometrics not from the theory point of view, but from the point of view of learning how to drive. And so basically that is what led me to rethink about econometrics. Instead of thinking about statistics as you know, normal distribution and Poisson distribution, I say, how is statistics used in this world? Let, it, let me teach students how to use statistics to solve real world problems. Now, when you, uh, that's about how to drive the car. Now, don't worry about what goes, goes into the engine of the car. So most drivers, when they open up the hood of the car, they don't understand what's in there. They don't, they can't recognize the radiator and the spark plugs and they don't need to. They can be excellent drivers without that. So there was no such textbook at that time. No, uh, there's no such textbook even now, which can teach students how to drive, how to use statistics uh, without uh, teaching them the theory. So when I started this program, I took my students to the local Merkaz of Tabligh and we made dua to Allah to give us guidance and uh, 
enlighten us and, and guide us on this path towards this new field that I plan to construct because I'm not going to teach econometrics in the way that it was taught to me. So there is a very important distinction between useful knowledge and useless knowledge. Allah, Prophet of Allah asked for useful knowledge and sought protection from useless knowledge. So the question is for Muslim teachers, what is useful knowledge and what is useless knowledge? This is not part of the Western uh, tradition. <clears throat> How can we tell whether statistics is useful knowledge or useless knowledge? Is it permissible for us as Muslims to teach economics which is teaching the students that the rational behavior is to maximize pleasure. Is this what Islam teaches us? It doesn't teach us to maximize pleasure. Uh, is it permissible to teach calculus, zoology, bot botany? When the students that we are have, they will never use this information in their lives. <laughs> Only a very small specialized set of people will actually use this knowledge. Uh, much more important is learning how to live, learning how to become a better person, learning how to tell the truth, learning how to have courage, learning how to love others, learning how to have compassion. So then I was forced to ponder about what is useful and what is useless. And I realized that in the West, they make the distinction in a different way. So they say that useful knowledge is one that will allow us to earn money. But the, for a Muslim scholar, it's very different because there are so many ahadiths and the Quran is full of ayat about the value of knowledge. Uh, learning is from cradle to grave and two seekers are never satisfied, seeker of knowledge and seeker of money. And the ink of the scholars will be weighed more than the blood of the martyrs. So now as a Muslim teacher, I must ask myself, when the students are taking notes for my statistics class, is that ink going to be valued with the blood of the martyrs, the shahada? I could not believe this. It doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem logical. That's because this is not knowledge uh, in Islamic sense. Because it is being pursued for wealth and fame, for, for superiority over others, for arguments. So if you want to pursue useful knowledge and to that, that is the knowledge for which the ink will be worth the weight of the blood of the martyrs, then we have to start with the first question. What is the goal of life? This is the question they never ask in uh, Western universities. And you cannot study chemistry or physics to find out what is the goal of life. So Islam teaches us the goal is success on the day of judgment. And useful knowledge is that which will help us to achieve success on the day of judgment. And this is this kind of knowledge, knowledge that will help us achieve its success uh, on the day of judgment that is valuable, that's worth pursuing. So the question is, can statistics help us to achieve success on the day of judgment? So the first thing to do is to look at my intention. Why are we studying statistics? And so if we make the change in Nia that the Creation of God is like the family of God and Allah lo loves those who serve his family. So if we make the niyyah that I will use my learning of statistics to serve mankind, to serve humanity, to serve cre creation, then at least the niyyah will be correct. And with this niyyah, we can pursue this knowledge and uh, plan to use it for, and, and then this will be an act of worship, ibadah. So then we have to see how we can translate these words into practice. How can we use statistics to serve humanity? So the first step is to break the theory practice barrier. We cannot study the theory of statistics and say, okay, I'm teaching you the theory and you go and apply it to the field. So we must start with real world applications. So in some sense, um, I decided to work backwards. Start with the real world problem and then develop statistical theory as part of the solution. Instead of the standard Western method that study the theory and then study the application. We start from the application and then we work backwards to the theory. So the main lesson that I learned and, and I uh, developed this over 
10 years to start with a real world problem where statistics is used and then to see how we can, what kind of theory is needed to solve that particular problem. Um, one of the things that's highly deceptive in the West is that if you look at the statistical textbook, you will see a lot of real data and you will be deceived into thinking that they are doing real world applications. In fact, it's not true. If you look at those applications, you see that these are toy applications. It's just like the toy cars that you see, uh, you can, the children, for the children, they are nothing like the real cars. So it's just like this. If you look at the fake applications, you will find them everywhere in econometrics in statistics books, but you won't find any real applications. So to make statistics useful, we must teach students how to use statistics to solve real problems. And this is not easy to do because you won't find any such examples in your normal textbooks. You, you have to work hard. So the West does not accept this distinction between useful and useless knowledge. Uh, they think that all sorts of knowledge is equal. And uh, even if knowledge is certainly uh, is useless now, it be may become useful later. Uh, this universe was created by accident. It will perish by accident. Our lives have no meaning. All knowledge is equivalent since there is no purpose. If you don't have a purpose, then all knowledge is the same. So this attitude towards knowledge that all knowledge is the same and we only pursue knowledge to, uh, to, to earn wealth from it. This is a deadly attitude towards knowledge and not compatible with Islam. So in econometrics courses, I said, okay, let's start with how econometrics is used. And I realized that econometrics is used mainly to run regressions. So instead of starting by teaching the theory of regression, I said, okay, let's take a data set and let's run a regression on it. And how do you run a regression? You just feed it to the computer. And uh, so now you have the regression and the numbers. And now I started basically from the first lecture to explain Okay, here's the, uh, here's the data, here's the regression. What does it mean? <coughs> when we have this printout, how do we understand it? So this is like driving the car. You don't know what the computer did, but you can learn how to interpret a, reg a regression result. And uh, some, at some point you will need to study some statistical theory to understand what a T-statistic is. So you, ex you introduce it in that context. So this is the T-statistic for this coefficient. And this is what it means. This is how we understand it. So this leads to a radically different approach to standards. It's, it's sort of backwards from the traditional approach. And we have to change our approach to teaching. Instead of teaching students how to prove the Gauss-Markov theorem, we have to teach them how to understand it. We have to develop intuition. We have to develop knowledge of the heart. We don't need to learn calculations and the proofs because the computer can do that today. Symbolic mathematics can be taught by computers today. Yeah, it can be done by computers. So we have to teach students the meaning of calculus. What does it mean to draw a curve? What does the slope mean intuitively? And we can let the computer do the calculations. <clears throat> today in statistics and econometrics, we teach the students how to be the software. Uh, this, uh, that's the, 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 the program which which calculates X transpose X inverse X transpose Y. We teach them the meaning of this formula and how to calculate, how to do matrix inversion and so on. But this is not necessary. What we need to do is teach the students is the intuition. Why did this result emerge from the calculations that we did? So this is a very different approach to teaching. So there are some general principles for launching an educational revolution. And that is that we should try to develop intuition and understanding of, the, uh, of uh, students, not teach them theorems and proofs. Let the computers do the computing. In economics theory, we, have, we teach uh, courses in uh, dynamic programming in which we teach students how to solve two or three optimization problems because that's all that we can do. That, that's all that can be done with pencil and paper. If instead we said, okay, the optimization is going to be done by the computer. Let the computer solve the optimization. Teach the students where we need to do optimization. What are the real world problems that can be solved by the, by the optimization methods and, and take them through solutions of real world problems. That will be much better. And so 
uh, this is in, in the Western curriculum all over the world, useless knowledge is being taught uh, huge amounts of this to students. If you just think about your own life and you remember this, uh, the subjects that you studied in, in school, the chemistry, biology, physics, mathematics, economics, and you ask, what use was this in my real life? Uh, you will see that it has no application to real life. So this is a, a fake education. And a, a real education teaches you how to live. A fake education teaches you how to do a job to earn money. And so basically, this statistics course that we are going to do is a demonstration of how we can change our approach to teaching and how we can teach the fundamental principles on the basis of Islamic epistemology, not on the basis of Western epistemology. The, the Western epistemology says that useful knowledge helps us to earn money. And Islamic epistemology tells us that useful knowledge teaches us how to live better lives. And so that is the end of my talk for today. And we can now open up the floor for questions. Uh, okay, thank you, Prof, for the lecture. Uh, and who uh, want to ask to the professor, uh, please uh, write uh, it in the chat box. Okay. Uh, okay, we uh, for Faisal Munir, can you ask directly? Assalamu alaikum, sir. Um, I am really grateful for uh, such a, uh, I mean, um, talk. And uh, actually, today I was passing by a uh, road in Karachi and uh, Dawat is Dul uh, Quran. Uh, they were uh, holding a banner that Sud Ka Nizam Khatam Kare. And uh, so that, uh, but may I asked uh, from that person that do you have any alternative? Like how we are going to, I mean, abolish the banks and all the system if you are saying that Sud Ka Nizam Khatam Kare because everything is dependent on this. So, sir, I mean, uh, you have uh, really spoken my heart. And actually, uh, uh, I just felt from few years that it should be like this. But how we are going to do this and how we are going to break the inertia of uh, whatever is happening around the world, because they are 98 or 99% of the economic system, uh, which you are saying that this is useless. Yes, you are absolutely right. It is not an easy matter to um, end the um, Sudi Nizam, the system of interest which is covering the globe. I have a number of articles on that. Uh, I have an uh, article called uh, Islamic Monetary System, which explains how we can build an alternative. But it is not easy because it's penetrating everywhere. So you have to take small steps. One step at a time is the motto. And you have to understand that the steps have to be sequenced. Some people want to do the advanced steps first and uh, not the preparation. If you try to take a big step without having prepared the ground, you will fall down. So, uh, and, and, and finding the sequencing, what is the first step, what is the next step? This is difficult. This is not something which is immediately obvious at all. So there are some small steps we can take towards uh, ending the Sudi Nizam, but they are not the ones that uh, most people are thinking about. It requires some thought some knowledge, some understanding of how the economic system works in order to take these steps. But it can be done. Yes. Oh, there are lots of hands. So let me uh, take them in sequence. Noman Siddiqui, can you ask your question? Uh, Assalamu alaikum, sir. Uh, my question is about, uh, as you mentioned, that the background of statistics is all about all towards positivist uh, approach to uh, data, you can say. But then, of course, we had seen uh, there are certain uh, other competing uh, theories and philosophies like interpretivist approach. And then there, this constructivism actually is all what uh, maybe uh, to a certain extent, what you're proposing is to, instead of uh, doing having the data uh, taught through the formulas and the numbers, why not to focus more on interpretivism? So can you share some light about uh, this interpretivist approach and how the statistics can be seen from the lens of interpretivist? Yeah. 
Yes, you are right that <clears throat> there is a lot of uh, ferment in the West and the positivist approach is being attacked. But none of these people, the interpretists and, and the other critical realism and many others, they have not looked at the field of statistics. So how this works in um, statistics, they have not seen. Um, and besides, I think that if you want to, um, uh, basically, if you want to know the answer to this question, you should look at Rajiv Shanturk's lectures in which he has examined all of these approaches which are coming from the West. And he has said that these are all uniplex approaches. These are all one method uh, is right. And he says that Islam offers us a multiplex approach which says, okay, we can do interpretive understanding and we can even do positivist understanding and we can do uh, critical realist. And we have to take all of them. We have to have multiple perspectives to achieve understanding. And so if you follow the, uh, uh, if you just search for decolonizing the social sciences and Rajiv Shantur, then uh, you will find he has a sequence of five lectures on this topic and he will be able to, but uh, he, uh, and you, he provides out the theoretical framework. I am uh, doing a much more practical hands-on applied job. So I'm not looking at the philosophical background but if you want to look at the philosophical background, it is there. And Rajiv Kandruk has done a very good job of explaining uh, the philosophical background. All right, so uh, Muhammad Yasser, I think. Yeah, Muhammad. Assalamualaikum. Yeah. Assalamualaikum. First, Jazakallah khair for the lecture is very, very good. Um, just a question. Uh, first question, more administrative, maybe someone can help. Are the slides going to be uploaded or emailed to us? Um, it would be good if they could be. Um, secondly, I wanted to ask, uh, you talked about uh, your time with the Tabligh, so I was just curious, how much of a role and in what way did the Tabligh and Islamic learning as well play in your overall journey? Uh, can you repeat that? I didn't uh, catch the question very clearly. So you spoke a bit about the tabligh and how that yes. affected you. So I just want to know in what way did the tabligh oh, work okay. as well as Islamic learning? Yeah. Basically, you see, when it, I came to the realization that all of this economic theory is wrong, uh, I was inclined to doubt myself. I said, how can it be? Uh, I am just um, one person and uh, everybody people very, very smart, people who have Nobel Prizes, people who have uh, done such uh, massively complicated mathematics. And I'm saying that this is all wrong. How can it be? Probably I've made some mistake in understanding. So the Tabli gave me the courage to understand that somebody who doesn't accept God, who does not, uh, cannot see through the signs of the universe and understand that this universe was uncreated and then it became created. So there must be a creator. Somebody who cannot even understand the simple logic can make fundamental mistakes. So this courage was necessary for me to do the work required to understand that this is really true. So uh, actually Tabligh was very fundamental to my um, uh, the process of understanding. It gave me the faith in the unseen that the possibility that this can be done. So let me go to Imran, Muhammad Imran Khan. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, sir, my question is uh, related to uh, basically Islamic and uh, the environmental economics. I uh, feel that it is an opportunity to ask uh, such type of question. Sir, actually, uh, in which type of economics, matlab, Islamic economics or conventional economics, we can uh, uh, see the environment uh, through, uh, I mean, in a better lens, uh, the environmental economics. How can we see the environmental economics in Islamic economics and conventional economics? And which is better uh, for the purpose of uh, environmental sustainability? There is a lot of, uh, I have a lot of, I have a few articles on that and there is a lot of other work on that. If you, I've just given a link to my blog, which is uh, azprojects.org. 
wordpress.com. This is my blog. And, uh, oh, I made a mistake in typing. And if you search on this blog for this topic, you will find it. Interesting. <clears throat> okay. So let me go to the next question. Uh, Adil. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam. Sir, you, in your lecture, you said that we will apply directly different methods to the real world data. But yes. if methods are already developed on wrong philosophy, philosophy and having a wrong philosophical foundation, how the results will be right? And how can we then interpret those results? Well, that is what we are going to teach in this uh, course. There are 12 chapters and we will discuss this issue in detail. In this uh, lecture, I didn't talk about uh, statistics at all. Uh, so I didn't even discuss the, the very first uh, concept. So uh, if you follow the course, then inshallah you will um, and learn the answer to your question. Saif. Saif. Welcome back. Next question. Yes. Saif. Um, Saif? Yeah. Yes. Unmute yourself and ask the question, Saif. Assalamu alaikum, Mustab. Jazakallah uh, khair for this lecture because it's it's a privilege to listen to you and be part of this uh, course that you are offering. Uh, my question and comment is twofold. First of all, the thing that you are presenting is quite important, I think, because in the de decolonial literature, most of the focus has been on principles or fundamentals or theoretical aspects of uh, disentangling the history of knowledge from the Eurocentric uh, sort of a yoke. And what you are trying to do or what you are doing, uh, inshallah, is to present practical applications of this effort which has been happening. So I think this is extremely, extremely important. The other thing which I wanted to ask you is this, that uh, there are two main names which comes to my mind when I think about decolonial efforts. One is uh, Sayyid Naqib al uh, who sort of started this pro particular project uh, of Islamization, Islamization of knowledge. Uh, and the other one is the current uh, uh, researcher, Professor C.K. Raju from India. So could you, could you briefly highlight how your efforts uh, parallel with their efforts or how they complement their efforts and what could be the differences? Yes, that's a good question. Basically, the decolonizers understand that the major problem that we face is the colonization of minds. And so we have to learn to think without the Eurocentric lens, which we have been all been taught to think through. All right, so suppose we do that. So, so there is one part of the effort is, okay, remove your Eurocentric glasses. All right, so after you remove them, then what do you see? So I'm, I'm working on the second step. So after assuming that decolonization has taken place, that is, we have removed the, then how do we rebuild knowledge? So in the Ghazali project, I have discussed this. Uh, that there are three, three steps. The first step is um, the, um, the uh, removal of doubt, deliverance from doubt. And that is the step in which we acquire faith in our deen, that it is indeed correct and complete and perfect. And then the second step is tahafatul philosopher. So decolonization is basically about the tahafatul philosopher, rejecting the ideas of the Western philosophers. Right. Then there is Ahiya Ulumuddin, which is to take the religious sciences and build all knowledge upon them. So this is the third stage. So this is what I am doing. MashaAllah. Jazakallah khair, Ustad. Thank you very much. Okay. Ayatullah Sayyid. Ayatullah Sayyidu. Welcome. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Professor. Can you hear me? Um, my question is, is it possible to achieve your level of econometric or statistical skills attending um, universities other than the Ivy, typical Ivy League uh, universities, probably studying the same courses, if you like? Uh, is it possible? And how does one do that uh, in the unconventional sense? Thank you very much. Yeah, this is a very good question. The thing is that the skills that are being taught at Harvard are uh, actually a form of ignorance. They say that, okay, we take some data and then we make some assumptions in order to make do statistical analysis. But those assumptions are wrong. So what you're being taught at Harvard is ignorance, not knowledge. So just throwing it away leads to advance. And uh, so, yes, indeed, we, we, we will not teach the mathematical stuff that is being taught in uh, Harvard, but uh, not teaching it is already a benefit because that mathematics leads to ignorance and uh, confusion. Uh, nobody actually understands, even when I was there at Stanford, that what is actually a parameter and what is a true parameter and what's a false parameter. And, and basically all of statistics is about estimating parameters from data. And this is completely a, a, a foolish thing to do. You don't want to estimate parameters from data. Uh, you want to use data in a different way. So by changing the purpose, uh, we don't need to acquire the same skills. We can just bypass them. Okay, so half is Sahib. Yes, uh, welcome, Hafiz Zahir Ahmad. Assalamu alaikum, Ustad. Uh, you are doing a great work, sir. Uh, nowadays, against uh, conventional economics, uh, it is like uh, you are working like a Musa in the era of Iran because con uh, conventional economics is dominated on the world. I have a fear, I am scattered uh, that like Ibn al-Hasham, Ibn al-Khwarzmi, after their work, uh, uh, they had not any student who continued their work. And I have same fear for you, sir. Uh, you have a lot of students. I, I am the student of uh, international Islam, Islamic economics. Uh, I have a question that do you have some close uh, uh, students who are working uh, on your ideas, on your thinking, uh, like at the Bleak after Haji Abdul Baha, there will be other Amir who will continue the same practice. This is uh, uh, more fearing for me because I am your student uh, and I like uh, your work a lot, a lot of time, but I have this fear. Uh, sir, uh, I ask you this question. Do you have uh, some students, learning <coughs> students, who will continue your work? <clears throat> uh, currently, there are 675 students who have registered for this course. So, inshallah, they will continue this work. Allah Ta'ala will spread his light regardless of what we do. It yes. is for us to be part of the process. Sure, sir. Inshallah, sir. Dr. Sayyid Ahmad Ahmed and Mahat Ali. The next question from Sayyid Ahmad Ali, doctor. Assalamu sir. for this session. Uh, it's really interesting for me. Well, uh, my comment is that, uh, as you mentioned in your lecture, that uh, you recommended your student that to focus on the uh, application and the uh, interpretation of the result and the use of the statistics, uh, not toward the theory. So does it mean that we want to produce uh, our Muslim student as our uh, user of the statistic, like a driver of the car, not the engineer. This is my question. <clears throat> yes, this is the, you see, once you understand that what matters is how you use it, then you come to the realization that most of the machinery that has been put into this car is useless. You can just take it out and throw it away and it will reduce the weight of the car and make it go faster. So, a lot of the theory that has been developed is just completely useless garbage and it's just uh, taking up weight. So that's the point that once you start developing from the point of view that we have to use this, 
then you can improve the machinery also and the engineering also. Okay, next, Dr. Bilal. Next come for Dr. Bilal to the question. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, I'm Dr. Bilal from Kashmir. Uh, so my question is same that was delivered before me. Yes. Sir, I want to say that what you are approach is that it is not a child that we give the calculator in our hands and without understanding it, it gives the operations of mathematics. And the other thing is that when we talk about real life problems, रेट ऑफ इंटरेस्ट मनी सप्लाई इन्वेस्टमेंट कंजप्शन इनमें जो रिलेशंस हैं क्या ये रियल लाइफ प्रॉब्लम्स नहीं हैं क्या हमारे पास जो क्राइम मॉडल हैं जस्ट लाइक जो क्राइम रेट हैं इट इज इट हैज अ रिलेशन विद द पॉवर्टी अनएम्प्लॉयमेंट लोकेशन फैक्टर जेंडर फैक्टर सर अगर इस पे थोड़ी बहुत आप रोशनी डाल सकते हो कि ये रियल लाइफ प्रॉब्लम्स जो हैं आप किन चीजों को रियल लाइफ प्रॉब्लम्स कहते हो क्योंकि मैं एक इतना बता सकता हूँ कि मैं आपके लिटरेचर को पिछले तीन साल से पढ़ रहा हूँ and I'm very thankful to you कि I got a sort of I can say a line where I should use myself and I'm using for that thank you for that अस्सलाम वालेकुम अलैकुम सलाम असल में what we are trying to do is exactly the opposite के उसको कैलकुलेटर बताएं हम तो कहते हैं कि कैलकुलेशन तो कंप्यूटर्स पे छोड़ दो तुम सोचना सीख that is, we are trying to teach the students how to think about problems, not how to do the calculations needed to solve them. So he is asking that we are teaching students the, we are, we are, we are trying to teach students how to intuitively solve problems, not, and, and to understand problems, not uh, the techniques required. The techniques are left to the computer. So uh, he also asked about, uh, you know, if we want to study the crime rate, we can regress it on poverty and on other variables. So in my view, this is nonsense. <coughs> we will never understand crime by doing regressions. <coughs> you want to understand crime? Look at the people who are doing crime. Go and interview them. Ask them what is in their heart. Why do they crime? And uh, what, what is... Maybe it's because they don't have a sense of moral purpose. Maybe they are needing to feed their families. So different types of moral configurations can exist for doing crime. Some people don't think crime to be a crime. Some people think that crime is a crime, but they are uh, doing it out of necessity. So these, these are things that are not going to be captured in the variables. <clears throat> so we need to go and look at real world problems and uh, get real world solutions and running reg regressions is not going to help it's going to hurt because you're going to get the wrong types of answers from that okay so Olam Ras is one of my students actually <coughs> yes. okay welcome uh, brother. Salam alaikum, sir. Sir, it's a great honor for us I'm your student at Pied and uh, I just, uh, without taking any time, I just want to ask a question about the uh, practice and uh, mathematical derivations of the regressions. Uh, uh, you know that I did work on spurious regression and we develop a model and we try to gauge out the problem in co-integration and unit you know, testing <coughs> proposed an alternative method. Yes. But the problem is that we published that paper in Impact Factor Journal, but even though after this, we didn't get the uh, intention from the, the good journals. Uh, they didn't accept our paper because <laughs> we have uh, no mathematical derivations. So what we can do for uh, our ideas, how we can uh, flourish our ideas, how we can spread our ideas without mathematical derivations? Well, <clears throat> the... Um establishment is going to oppose this approach to statistics very strongly because it devalues what they know 
and the skills that they have and it tries to develop new skills which they don't have so this is going to be a battle it is not something that uh, that is uh, like you know in in, in general we, we think of knowledge as a cumulative process you have some knowledge i have some more knowledge and we can put it together uh, and and uh, add to knowledge but this is not <clears throat> when you have a paradigm shift then you're saying that no the knowledge that you have is wrong the mathematical derivations that you are doing are meaningless and they are useless they don't tell us anything and so we are going to do things very differently so the other people are not going to say okay you are right they are going to say no you are wrong and we are right and this our calculations are right so this is going to be a battle for knowledge and this is a battle which has to be fought and ultimately the results will determine that when we do an analysis data analysis which leads to better results from the ones that they are doing then we will show that okay your theory leads to this conclusion and this conclusion is wrong and harmful and my theory leads to this conclusion and when we apply this solution we get much better results so that's where the solution will come it will not come in trying to convince people to do less mathematics or more mathematics so kashif khan uh, thank you professor zaman it was very moving uh, to attend your lecture uh, i'm kashif from carnegie mellon university america and uh, i have been like lately i have caught an inspiration in this field like a, a whole spread of discussion is going on here on algorithmic injustices which are just based on optimization and uh, which focus on efficiency so your perspective is very appealing uh, my question is not very much related to any uh, like uh, about the whole concept that you are going to portray or you we will be covering it's uh, more a bit uh, an administrative question like uh, i was trying to uh, find out any link where i can go through all the contents that we will be covering and what it will be expected from uh, the participants like how would be the schedule of classes and other stuff so is there anything uh, that can be made available at this point that will give us give me an idea that how much time i have to spend in future and like how i can plan about this thing so it will be great and after uh, another thing like uh, you have mentioned uh, some uh, person like rajab uh, uh, i could not pronounce. so if if you can share a link over here so it will be great that uh, i'll go through that and and uh, lots of prayers for your, uh, for the mission and definitely we are here to uh, further whatever you are saying because it's very uh, very moving and one who is having this side of view and the other side of view is like i'm trying to make up a lot of sense out of this discussion that we had today thank you god bless you sir jazakallah um, i will put a link to that soon they do not want you to hear this <laughs> oh my god auto is actually legit i don't know like um i am trying to find the link um all right about the details of the course i was hoping to have that for you in this uh, session but it hasn't gotten uh, done yet but very soon i will send the details uh, we will have uh, multiple uh, we will have multiple types of uh, oops we will have multiple uh, ways to take the course and uh, this will be uh, so there will be one self paced version where you can take it at your own pace and go at your and then there will be some guided versions where we will be going through the material together with live lectures so that will have some a pace i haven't actually determined there are 12 chapters in the book and <clears throat> a slow pace would mean that we do one chapter every two weeks and we have lecture every two weeks that would take six months and that would be very easy for everyone to do because uh, one chapter uh, in two weeks would be easy uh, or we could go slightly faster and do one chapter every week that would involve um, weekly lectures and that would finish in three months so we are actually in process of trying to come up with um, three different alternatives for three different types of audiences and this will be put up uh, soon uh, i have put a link to the rajab shantuk lecture 1 and once you watch this then you can go to the subsequent lectures in sequence all right so
Next is Radit. Yeah. Prof. Radit. Welcome, Prof. Yes. So is it Raditya Sukmana? Yes, yes, uh, Prof. Asad, uh, this is Raditya Sukmana from Indonesia. Thank you for the lecture, Prof. Okay, I do agree with you when you mentioned about the orientation of the conventional economics is on the consumption. More consumption is better. But they also not not uh, consistent because uh, the more consumption, they will have a diminishing marginal utility. So until certain time, when they add more, and even negative. So how can they um, uh, propose uh, to consume more while their utility is getting decreased. So that's, uh, I, do, I do agree with you, Prof. Asad. Maybe you can elaborate on that one. And now my second question is this, Prof. Um, you mentioned uh, you have written on Islamic monetary system. I also yeah. teach Islamic monetary system. How do you, how do you uh, address the issue of uh, what is being proposed by Prof. Ahmad Kamil Medin Mira, which is based on uh, commodity gold uh, for, to replace the current uh, existing Viat money uh, to achieve the stabilization of the price. Uh, thank you, Prof. <clears throat> yeah, I don't agree with this idea of uh, of uh, commodity money, any of gold money. I think that this is not going to work. Uh, I have a different uh, suggestion for uh, that, and I will put a link to this. Uh, in my uh, in, in the comment chat for my article on uh... Prof. Kamil also do not uh, agree to use a physical asset prop, just the value of the commodity gold is being used not the <coughs> not that we are uh, borrowing the physical gold to for the uh, money that we want to make a transaction um this is a complicated topic and uh, doesn't have to do yes. with what we are doing here. And uh, in my article, I have discussed uh, how an Islamic mon monetary policy can be made. Yeah, but there are Rob. many different standpoints on this issue. All right. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is Irwan Harun. Okay, Nick. next question. Welcome, brother Irwan. Okay, Assalamualaikum. Prof, uh, I have two questions, Prof. The first, uh, we really know West is more rational in understanding life, while Muslims are very concerned about Adab, hurt, intuition. Even Muslims really believe in unseen, according to what Al-Quran said, beginning of first of Al-Baqarah. And I think maybe because of that, Muslims face a lot of opposition from various countries especially developed country in the West and in Asia who have rational thinking pattern. So my question is, uh, if this is continuous like this, how we created future generation of Muslim with strong fight to be able to defend Islam, defend Quran and face the war of talk in the future? Could you give us the step forward to preparing it? This is the first second. <clears throat> and the second is, what is the real knowledge that we should learn in life so that we don't waste time for studying garbage science, maybe, sir. Thank you. Well, for the first question, So Allah Ta'ala is sufficient for us. So the only thing we need to worry about is how to improve our connection with Allah. We don't need to worry about what the uh, we don't need to worry about how the enemies are <laughs> responding to uh, what we do. Uh, <clears throat> the second thing is that yeah, the best kind of knowledge is the knowledge which teaches us how to become better human beings, how we can leave our, lead our lives in a good way. And this is something which the West cannot teach us. So this is something which we need to learn. And today we are not focusing on that. We're focusing on acquiring knowledge, degree, job, and getting money and pleasure. And this is not the thing which Islamic teaching teaches us. It teaches us how we can become better persons, and how, can, how we can build our families, and how we can build better neighborhoods and communities and societies. These are the essential things. 
So that's the two question. Then we move on to Juharia. Uh, sorry, Prof. I interrupt. Uh, yeah. There's a question for, uh, to uh, from my chat because the chat chat box is locked. Yeah. 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 Uh, there uh, from Bu Loni from Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, she asked about in this new approach of statistic or Islamic epistemology, do we have to absolutely leave Western theory or we just need to change how we use it, renew the order of the use of statistic? This question rise in my mind after you said about how we use statistic after finding a real life problem. Does not it mean that we actually have to master Western statistics that use in Islamic way approach? No, um, real life problem comes from the world. I mean, we, are, we have a problem that there are lots of poor people in the world. So how can we solve it? Can we use statistics in this? So one part is this, that uh, in the real world problem, sometimes the solution will not come by doing calculation and statistic. It will come by saying, okay, uh, we should uh, try to encourage people to give more zakat and more sadaqat instead of um, doing the calculations. So that's one, one thing. The second thing is, yes, we are free to borrow from the West, whatever they have created. The knowledge is the lost property of the moment. But the way that statistics has been built over the past century, it has been built on wrong foundation. So it's basically wrong. So we cannot borrow falsehood from the West. We can borrow knowledge if they have it, but what they have is the illusion of knowledge. <clears throat> it seems like knowledge, <clears throat> but it is not. It is actually fraud. So this statistics, the most important book in statistics is called the, the most uh, famous, the one that has sold millions of copies, much more, the, the most popular textbook is called How to Lie with Statistics. So we don't want to learn how to lie with statistics. You want to turn, learn how to tell the truth. So, can we go to Juhairia now? Okay, welcome, Sister Juhairia Nur Asia. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, wow. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm new here, so, and I'm not a lecturer or someone who knows statistics, but I am interested that uh, to get to know more about this course. And I noticed that Miss Arida and Miss Lisa are from Indonesia, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So I just want to know uh, how can I get in touch with you all, and is there any learning community that I can join? I'm currently in Tangerang, so it's not so far uh, from Jakarta. Thank you. These people are uh, the Sister Lisa and Arida are the coordinating the Ghazali project in Indonesia, and I think you should give her the your uh, contact information for the Ghazali project. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sister Juhairia, uh, later we uh, give you uh, in the chat box uh, from Instagram and YouTube how you can uh, communicate with us. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Farhan. Farhan, welcome. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Asad. This is Farhan. Uh, I've been following you for about three years. I was a graduate from London in 2004. If you remember me, I did some work for your blog also earlier. Oh, I see. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Asad, there was just, uh, I was just thinking, you mentioned that uh, prior to this uh, mathematification, if I if that's the correct term of statistics or economics, most of economics was qualitative and historical. Yes. So if we are to, and I also uh, agree with that paradigm, that most of the real world problems involve a qualitative aspect to it. So are we indirectly alluding that statistics has a very narrow application or it's supposed to be used in, in conjunction with a lot of qualitative aspects? For example, one, uh, one colleague here mentioned about uh, running regressions for crime with crime and poverty rates. So, but that involves a very large qualitative aspect <laughs> in able to analyze the problem. So, am I correct in saying that the statistics, the field of statistics or the numbers game is a very small area in terms of application in the real world? Yes, absolutely. In fact, 
it's worse than that. Basically, the positivist philosophy says that appearances are all that matter. So you can just analyze the numbers and get the answer in numbers. But basically, the word real in real statistics says that you can never get the answer from the numbers directly because the answer, the questions lie in the real world and the solution also lie in the real world. So uh, whatever you do with the numbers, first you have to look at the link between how the numbers came from the real world, then whatever solution you get, you have to take it and put it back into the real world context. So there are no solutions to be found within the numbers alone. So it, it is um, definitely true though, that uh, our approach is very different from uh, Western approach. Yes, Fatima. Uh, sorry, Prof. Uh, our time is over uh, okay. around 10 That's minutes. Right. Maybe we continue the question? Or... Yeah, That's we continue. Right. 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 I'm Fatima Sumro. Yes, Fatima Hello. As far as sir, Fatma Sumra, Fatma sir, you pointed out and you talk in your lecture useful and useless knowledge. In yes. my opinion, the knowledge that serves humanity is useful. So, how can we differentiate useful and useless knowledge uh, by statistics or by economics formulas? All right, I have a whole lecture on that uh, in my course and if you go to my blog and search for useful knowledge and useless knowledge you will find the answer uh, it's a long discussion thank thank you sir you're welcome thank you sir you're welcome. there are two uh, yeah, we can go two more questions and then we can stop okay welcome brother for conal hub assalamualaikum ustad alaikum assalam is that come higher before is that would you mind to answer my question if i send you some question in your email not at all uh, go ahead and send me questions in email yes okay thank you Ustad. you're welcome sadia bibi that may be the last question hopefully Assalamu alaikum, sir. I'm from Pakistan. Yes. Um, I have recently completed my master uh, MSc in statistics from International Islamic University. Yes. And uh, uh, can I ask or your voice is breaking up? Can you speak loudly or clearly? We got. Sorry, sister. Saadi. Okay. We heard that you completed your master's, but after that we lost. Maybe you can type uh, in the chat box to Arida and she will convey your question. You can go to Abdu Dauf. Abdu Dauf. Welcome, brother. Abdu Dauf. <laughs> Voice is very Again, you can maybe put your question in the chat box because uh, your voice is not coming through at all. All right, I think this can okay. be the last question from Amna Rahman. Amna. You're welcome. Amna Rahman. Assalamualaikum, sir. My name is Amna Rahman, and I have also recently uh, graduated from Islamic University. It's I have done actually bachelor's from there in statistics, and the same queries is that the teachers are just uh, not focusing on what do we have to do with statistics in our real life, and uh, not just fo just focusing on memorizing the same things, just like you know, like learning or uh, uh, it word to word one thing all the time, but not even uh, telling us that uh, how to apply it in our real lives, how it is very useful in our lives, how we can further take it in our future. Just um, they are just uh, telling us to only memorize all the subjects like uh, 
hips uh, all these you know so the teachers they are just um, not even telling us that what is this basically what they, we are all studying and all uh, just a, uh, like you know it's just a course which they um, they are uh, uh, lecturing us till and not even telling what are their applications even in, in our real life that's my question actually yes this is the way it is taught all over the world there is no no easy solution so that is what we are trying to do is to develop an alternative in this course okay so i think we can stop here and, uh, um yes uh, uh, hopefully uh, i will send uh, instructions by email to on the next steps in this course and also uh, probably two weeks from today on sunday at the same time we will have the next lecture for this course but you will get the links and the instructions and how to join the course via email all right thank you very much for okay. joining me thank you so much uh, jazakumullah khairan prof uh, asad zaman for sharing with us about the uh, your experience tonight hopefully we can continue this class to the next class after two weeks later from this day in the same time uh, and thank you for the audience to join us with this first class st uh, statistic uh, and thank you also for alnaf management have to support the live streaming and zoom in this first class statistic maybe we can say uh, alhamdulillah for the end uh, the class assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh assalamu alaikum professor thank you everyone